My name is Rick Viscomi. I'm a maintainer at HTTP Archive. It's an open source web performance and accessibility and security tool. Uh, my day job is a developer of programs engineer at Google. Um, they let me work on HTTP Archive full time. Uh, my, my focus is on web transparency, not just performance, which is pretty good. Um, I joined the DPE team about five months ago. Before that, I was a web developer at YouTube. Um, so it's kind of nice to have both sides of uh, focusing on the performance of a particular website and now transition to looking at the web performance and of the web as a whole. That's a little uh, I'll introduce the rest of the team. Uh, Steve Souders created the tool in 2010. Uh, he was inspired by the Internet Archive, which you all might know does the Wayback Machine. And while that focuses on uh, the content of the web, Steve was inspired to make something that tracked the composition of the web. He wanted to know how it was built and tracked that over time. So he was really the mastermind behind the whole thing. He wrote a lot of the initial of the pipeline and the website itself. He also had help from Pat Meenan, who you might know as the creator of WebHS. Uh, Pat helped set up a bunch of private instances of WebHS to run these thousands of tests. Um, and Ilya is uh, kind of like the head cheerleader of HTTP Archive. Um, since Steve left a few months ago, Ilya has really taken on the role of uh, driving the vision, and um, he also is responsible for integrating BigQuery into the pipeline, so you can do a lot of uh, really deep analysis of the data. So that's who we are. Uh, this is what HTTP Archive is. It tracks how the web is built, and I highlight these two words uh, because they're really the pillars of HTTP Archive. Um, we track how the web is built, uh, we deconstruct the web into its raw materials. Uh, you can think of it like when a house is built, it's made up of a bunch of lumber, nails, and hand tools, and power tools. Um, if we wanted to understand how a house is built and learn everything we can about it, we want to know how many nails were used. Where did you get that wood? Well, how much did it cost? Two by four, four by four, everything about the web. Um, and when we say we want to track the web, we want to learn how it used to be built, compare it against how it's currently built. Um, this enables some interesting analysis. Um, we could correlate um, things that have happened, uh, certain events in time. Um, for example, when they started enforcing smoke detectors in houses, you might be able to say, did houses get safer after this point? Did fewer houses burn down? Um, for the web, we can look at web standards and see how did that actually help? Um, did a new new API improve performance or security on the web? Another important thing about tracking the web is trends. You can see the trajectory of where, where things have been, where they are now, but also where they're going. Um, the right side of this page is the uh, web HTTP archive looks like today. It's a trends page. Um, it's a time series of data. It's a bunch of metrics, um, including uh, page transfer size and bytes per shift of the network, and many, many other stats. On the left side, these are more of snapshots in time, uh, what the websites looked like at the time. The great thing about the trends page is that you can go back seven years and look at how the web is built. This wall of text uh, is a high-level description of what HTTP Archive does. It tracks 500,000 websites as defined as the top websites by Alexa. Um, we crawl the home pages only on both desktop and mobile web. It runs on web page test under the hood. We get all of the metrics that you've come to love from web page test on the waterfall, hard traces. Um, we've recently integrated Lighthouse audits. Um, if you're not familiar, Lighthouse is a tool that measures progressive web happiness. Um, not just performance, but also um, security and accessibility, um, how modern the site is. Um, and also custom metrics, we'll get into a little bit later, but the gist of it is you can 
run JavaScript on the page at runtime and gather metrics about how the web is built, how the web page is built. Um, gives you access to things like the DOM at the time and all the JavaScript global scope. Uh, HTTPRF.org is our um, front end. I like to call it the tip of the data bird. Uh, it has the trends and stats, but also a discussion forum where uh, if you would like to get help with some of your analysis, there's plenty of people there happy to uh, provide assistance. Uh, if you found something interesting, you can share it there. Um, the BigQuery and Cloud Storage repositories are uh, where the raw data lives. And um, it's immensely helpful to have this raw data so that you can um, provide your own uh, slicing and dicing if you want to do something different from what you would do on the website. So to take it, you know, sum all that up graphically, um, every other week, HTTPR archive runs half a million websites. Technically a million if you count both desktop and mobile. On 134 different web page test statements um, that sit on the Internet Archive architecture. And HTTP Archive, uh, the server, manages the syncing between the Google Cloud services, BigQuery and Google Cloud Services. When I say data bird, this is what I mean. We have these curated stats and trends that we can pick, but there's so much more beneath the surface that's ready for mining. Um, there's things that we don't even know exist yet. Uh, so we really implore everyone, dig into the data and let us know what's wrong. So that's what it is. Um, show of hands, has anybody here used HTTP Archive before? Maybe about half, which is, that's really good. Um, so we found that um, three main groups of people use the data. Scholars have used it as a source in their research papers. This is pretty cool. It's um, included in publications like ACM, IEEE. The community uses HTTP Archive to answer questions about the state of the web. Eric Lawrence wanted to find out more about broccoli compression algorithm and its proliferation on the web. Sammy Everts, uh, when she was with SOSTA two years ago, noted that uh, the average web page was exceeding two megabytes. And we'll see that that record has been broken recently. This was uh, big news at the time when uh, this happened last year. Or actually, no, uh, yes, last April. The average web page size exceeded about 2.4 megabytes, which was the size of the game Doom. And I think the reason why this resonated in the community is because you think about how much that game did and the experience we had and the size limitations at the time. And when you say think about it in terms of give a website that same size restriction, and it just wastes it, right? It has bloated images, un uncompressed, everything, scripts and styles. So this is really um, what I love about web page, uh, not web page, uh, HTTP Archive, is that it gives you these insights about where the web uh, is going. This trend line on the right uh, just shows uh, how you can predict the future and see where the web will be, um, and hopefully make changes to avoid uh, inauspicious uh, milestones like this. Also, the Industry uses HTTP archive data for calibration of the schools. Uh, Lighthouse School, like I mentioned, um, in part of its um, page weight audit, looks at the typical size of a web page, now it's about three megabytes, and um, sets that as the um, you know, threshold. You know, if, uh, your website exceeds this amount that it has failed with the audit. And also, um, Addy and Sean from Webpack have a Default performance budget of uh, using HTTP archive data on average amount of JavaScript served. And they'll let you know if you've exceeded that budget. So, this is really cool stuff. Um, let's get into some case studies. Uh, the average web page, or the typical web page, comes up a lot. Um, people want to know how big it is and how it got so big. Uh, Tammy said it was two megabytes uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and we just got a tweet last week that the web has crossed the three megabyte milestone. 
Um, the answer to your question, how big is a, a, a typical website, why is it, could be summed up in this one tweet. It's three megs, mostly for the It's more than half what's possible. It's about 1.7 megs. Um, and where did this data come from? From the stats page that I was showing. So the data above the surface of that data bird uh, is really easy to access. If you have high level questions like this, you can visit the website. Um, but you may wonder where does that data come from? How do you generate these graphs? Uh, it comes from the database. Uh, this is publicly accessible, it's a big query. Uh, there will be a few different queries, so I'll just take a second to explain what you're looking at. Uh, this is Google SQL. It's the legacy flavor, there are a different couple of flavors. Um, you're just selecting from the July 1st desktop crawl the average size in megabytes of uh, records. That's about three megs. Just one thing. Um, I see some of you squirting your seat when I mentioned averages. You know the answer to that. All averages okay to use. Um, we should really be using medians instead. Uh, so this is the same type of query as uh, rework for medians. We're selecting the 501st quantile out of 1,001 quantiles. Um, the reason why it's an odd number is so that it's easier to pick the median. So if you imagine like an odd number of things, like I'm holding up 10 fingers, if you try to find the middle one, you're stuck with two. So you have to either choose one, the other, or a combination of the both, which is imprecise. So if you start with nine instead, and you work your way towards the middle, you're left with only one, and it's easy to say, this is the median value. Uh, and now looking at the value itself, it's only 1.4 megs. We still haven't crossed the median web page being size of it. So consider the context when you're getting numbers. Is it the average? Is it um, median? Some other percentile? Um, it's also important to mention, look at the other percentiles. You don't need to only look at the middle most. Uh, 75th, 25th are really interesting. We're going to be uh, changing the way the website works, you may be asking yourself, like, well, if averages don't tell you the whole picture, why do you put them on the website? So we will be changing the site to use medians and also some other percentiles to give a more complete picture of the distribution. Next case study uh, digs a little bit deeper into uh, the mine of data that we can provide. Um, we have recently exposed uh, JavaScript libraries that are detected on page. Um, and this is really, really cool because it can make use of the custom metrics that I had mentioned earlier to inspect the JavaScript global scope and see which libraries are currently on the page. And it can even tell you what version of that library is being used. Um, so you may ask, what are the top libraries as a follow up? How fast are they? Right? What, we care about web performance. What can we learn about? libraries on the web. So here's a relatively simple query uh, to find out the top 10 JavaScript libraries. Uh, you may notice that the table name here is scratch space. That indicates that this is a temporary table generated just for the purpose of gathering all the JavaScript library. Um, check out the discussion forum, which I'll plug later. Um, I go into how I generate that table. It's really interesting how you can massage the data to uh, get it to do what you need. Um, but for the sake of just getting uh, the top 10, uh, this is relatively simple. Are there any guesses what the top JavaScript library is? JQuery. JQuery. What percent of the web do you think is JQuery? 30, not need too much. WordPress. 100. WordPress. That's a good one. 100. So it turns out 83% of the web uses jQuery. And jQuery is by far the number one library. The number two library, which is also a jQuery library, is about a quarter of the size. This is huge. We shouldn't forget about jQuery. Um, as a web researcher or analyst, I want to dig into this data a lot more. I want to find out why is it the most popular, what kinds of sites is it on. It turns out 
WordPress plays a huge role, and also the 1.x versions are still in heavy, so sort of the most popular versions. So there's a lot that you can do uh, just with library information, but let's find out more about performance. So, well, actually, I have to show you this graph first. So, when you take all of the libraries, not just looking at the top 10 plot them, you can't even see the tail of it because BigQuery is so huge. So, what I had to do was make a logarithmic y axis just to see the rest. Um, and some other interesting data points here to call out are um, AngularJS has 2% share of the web, about 9,000 out of the 500 that we show. React has 0.4%. That's 2,000 websites. Um, but of the 0.4%, if you only look at the top 100 websites, React is in 3%. There's a heavy skew towards the most popular websites using React. Um, some of the interesting insights you can get when you're drawing uh, data against some other performance or ranking information. And of course, I have to say, when you are doing these tests, twice a month, it's very cool to see how this data changes week by week and month by month. You can see which libraries are becoming more or less popular. Um, I did an analysis a few weeks ago and found um, jQuery, Modernizer, YUI. These libraries are actually getting less popular. Um, the ones that seem to have been replaced with some standard uh, native APIs are becoming less necessary. Which is a good sign. So, onto the performance data. So, this query, you don't have to read all of it. It's just showing that you can join a couple of tables together and get uh, things like the start render time, uh, the amount of JavaScript that was being served to the page. Let's just see is there any correlation between JavaScript library popularity and performance? Here's the raw data. Interestingly, jQuery websites tend to have a faster start under time, and not the fewest, but one of the fewest amount, uh, amounts of JavaScript to serve. Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's try to you know, aggregate all uh, 100 libraries and uh, see what we can find in the correlation methods. Um, when you run queries on jQuery, you can export the data into a Google Sheet. And they give you a nice way to uh, get the correlation coefficient. So we will do that. And this is what we get. The correlation coefficient goes from negative one, which is a strong negative correlation, positive one, strong positive correlation. And anything close to zero means it's a weak correlation. So this is weak sauce. There's not a lot here. This is not uh, a strong correlation between performance and the latter popularity. Um, it's not that we failed to find interesting data here, it's just that we explored an avenue and turned out to be data. When you're doing analysis with big data, sometimes you have to try a few things to see what works. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have anything more interesting to say with this data, but that happens. The third case study uh, is also really interesting because it makes use of this new Lighthouse data. Um, one of their audits is the lang or language attribute and it checks to see if the website has any invalid uses of it. And if it has at least one, it fails the audit. Uh, so we can ask, what percent of the web has invalid attributes? Why are they invalid, and what can we do to fix it? So the query here um, uses the JSON extract method to dig deep into the JSON Lighthouse report uh, to dig out the score. And so binary metric is just true or false, and we're grouping the counts of each. So um, this is really cool that we're able to get aggregate information about Lighthouse. Before we integrated, we were only able to get information about a single website at a time. Now half a million websites uh, can be analyzed for progressive web happiness all at once. And they have about 80 audits in there that we get for free now. Does anybody have a guess um, what percent of the web has valid language attributes? 10%? 60? 
fairly surprising. Um, 99 percent. <laughs> Yeah, right. Asterisk. Um, if the website did not have any lang attribute, it is, it is automatically passing the test. Um, I think the, the real data is about 3% of the web uses a lang attribute. Um, the astute audience member may notice uh, wait a second, you said 500,000 URLs. How come true plus false is about 425? So not all of the tests uh, complete successfully. Some of the URLs that we run through HTTP archive have died a long time ago. Some, some of them are still stale. Um, we also have a limit to how much data we can put into BigQuery. It's two megabytes of data. Um, websites that have really bad lighthouse scores tend to have a lot of things stuffed into their report, like a lot of things wrong. Um, sadly, those are the ones that I want to dig into. Like, they have a lot of things wrong. I'm going to learn about uh, what I can find from that. So anyway, that is the scope of the problem. Now let's try to find out more about individual cases of what went wrong on, on these 424 uh, websites. Uh, we can use Lighthouse's details property uh, to actually extract the invalid values from and when we wrap this query in uh, something similar that just aggregates um, how many dollar values we have, we get something that looks like this. Uh, so because websites can have multiple line attributes, um, it turns out that there are uh, maybe on average two language attributes per page. Um, and the results here are actually they fit into only a few buckets, so let's dig deeper to what those buckets are. Let's just get these out of the way. Some nonsense values. It doesn't seem like the code author meant to give a language value. They just put some junk in there, maybe a template, spit out some garbage. Uh, maybe they intended to say, I don't want to specify any particular language, but there is no valid way to say no particular language. So if you wanted to do that, you just omit the attribute. Digging into the more interesting values here, um, it seems like people are confused about whether to use the TLD, the top level domain of the website, like the .com or .cz for Czechoslovakia, um, as the language tag. Um, there is a resource called the Language Subtag Registry, where uh, they provide all the mappings of language and region uh, to the correct subtag. Um, so Czechoslovakian um, subdomain CZ, the Czech language actually is CS, Georgia, KK, Kazakhstan, KK, China, ZH, and K. And another common problem, um, which is the number one and three problem, is uh, people getting confused between locales and language values. Um, they have the right language subtag, ZH. Is Chinese. CN is the China region, so it's Chinese as spoken in China and Chinese as spoken in uh, Taiwan. Um, and the problem here is that it's a limit. They're using underscores, and really the language attribute needs to be delimited by hyphens. Um, it also has to be uppercase uh, region, but if you notice in the query, I had to lowercase well, handed that. So I won't hold it against. And about here. Um, and the W3C article on language tags also suggests drop the region if it's not necessary. Um, Japanese, as spoken in Japan, could be redundant, so just say it's Japanese, just use Japanese. Sure. Why would you use that in the The question is. Why is the standard so specific? It is what it is. Sometimes the web is inconsistent in safety eyes. I have no idea. I wish things were more consistent um, and more tolerant of similar. Like, we know what you mean when you say ZHCM. It's pretty clear, but you're right. It, it would be nice if, if it did uh, support both. Okay, so those are the 
case studies, um, just to sort of start wrapping up. Um, a couple of things that are new in the tool. Lighthouse integration, you have eight uh, progressive web app with PWA audits available. Third-party JavaScript libraries are fully queryable now. Hat has done great work to upgrade the test agents over to Lex. Uh, it turns out that that's a little bit faster, which was needed to run the Lighthouse audits because they take up a bit more time. Fun fact, the crawls are spaced out every two weeks because it takes about two weeks to run a million web test agents. <laughs> so once we start adding more to the tool, we have to sort of cut back somewhere else. Yeah, but, uh, does uh, this time of day or time of week affect any of the metrics? Uh, like, I imagine it's time to uh, get the first bite might be affected by whether it's busy or not better. The question is, does time of day or week have an effect? And it absolutely could. If we happen to be crawling on Black Friday or Cyber Monday in our case, uh, yeah, the web will be a little bit slower that day. That might, might get the effect. Um, we do run each test three times and choose the media. Hopefully that'll smooth general inconsistencies out. Um, but I think on the whole, testing every other week sort of helps to to um, you know, alleviate some of those things. Okay. So that's what's new. Uh, coming soon, things that I'm really excited about. Um, we want to know, for example, is this website using WordPress? We had mentioned jQuery and how uh, it's very prevalent on the web. Why is that? It would be great if we could say, um, of the jQuery websites, how many of them are built on WordPress? Um, is there anything we can learn about the web um, slicing by these different demographics? The more demographics we have, the more we can find way in understanding who we have. Um, having the JavaScript library information allows us to join that again with security information. Think that we've been doing some work with the Lighthouse team to integrate with the SNCC vulnerability database, which kind of gets into scary territory. Now we have a database of 500,000 websites, and we can easily query, what are the vulnerable ones? So if you're a hacker, you can just hit the database. So it's almost an ethical level, but I come from a web transparency background, and I really feel like you need to shine the light on the dark parts of the web in order to make it better. So I think the more information we have about the state of the web, the better we can make it. Um, we're moving away from just a wall of metrics that you scroll infinitely and uh, discover on the website into more curated reports, bundles of relevant uh, related metrics. Um, for example, we'll have a JavaScript report or an SEO report, PWA report. Uh, you'll be able to find exactly what you're looking for and all of the related metrics that have to do with it. Um, we're going to be moving away from unresponsive or uninteractive pie charts uh, and finally getting some more interactive. Um, we're going to be using the high charts library to uh, help make things pretty. We're working with a designer right now that, you know, uh, the same kind of theme that you see in these slides will be with the website. Uh, so we're excited about it. Maybe we'll even make the website at PWA itself. You know. Um, part of my responsibility um, as both a maintainer of the HTTP archive and on the Google side of the house as a uh, developer relations engineer, I will be working on a video series. So I'll be sitting down with some uh, prominent members of the web community and asking them questions about some things that we see in the results. Uh, I might sit down with Tim and say, hey, what's up with half the web being vulnerable? Like, what can we do about that? I might sit down with Addy and talk about that. So I expect a lot of really cool things to come. Uh, some things that we really want to happen, but we're farther away from. We'd love to move away from Alexa, primarily because they stopped updating their list of top one minute sites sometime last year. So we're sort of stuck with a scaled version. Um, we would also really like to get um, information about the category of a website. Is it a news site? E-commerce, travel, it would be great to break down in addition to like WordPress or not. Um, learn about you know, what is the systemic problem with travel websites. Could they be something that we can address at that level? Um, we'd like to move beyond just the 500K, thinking about millions of websites. Uh, we want to tell what we still have to learn um, Speaking of millions of tests, um, I have to mention our sponsors because they make it possible. Um, 
it sits on Internet Archive architecture we have with other data data center. Um, but all the logos that you see in this box here um, have contributed in some way to either allow us um, to use free quota on uh, inquiry or gives us money for a server. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, maybe my company might want to sponsor, uh, hit us up at that email address. Uh, I can give you more information. Or if on a personal level you feel like you'd like to contribute, uh, we'd love to have more help. Uh, you saw my wish list of things. Uh, I'd love to have you help out. Uh, here's our GitHub account. Uh, we have a few different repositories, both front and back end. Um, this is the discussion forum that I had mentioned discussed about httparchive.org. Um, if you're digging into BigQuery and you're running into a wall, you don't know how to get around some error. We actually have one of the BigQuery developer relations engineers frequently in the forum. I ask them questions all the time. Things really pay off on everything great. Um, so there's a lot of help if you need it. Uh, or if you just find something really interesting, and like it's an awesome report, we'll bubble that up to the surface of that data bird so that everybody can see it on the website. Um, if you're interested in the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, we have a Slack account. Unfortunately, it's the free Slack account, so guests can't join themselves. Uh, this is a Bitly link that I'll take you to a Google form. Submit your email address. I'll send you an invitation. It's a little secure as well. We'll get you in. And this is my information. Um, a lot of the findings that I come across um, in my analysis, or if anybody else finds something interesting, I tweet it at my personal account, retweet it at the HTTP Archive account. Um, and if you need to contact us on more private channels, here's our email address. 